Hello, I'm Ben Godwin. Welcome to the Word Workshop recorded at the Good Springs Full Gospel Church. God of wonders beyond our galaxy, you are holy, holy. My wife Michelle and I have pastored the Good Springs Full Gospel Church since 1999. A spirit-filled church with a hunger for God and a heart for people. Good Springs Full Gospel Church is located in Walker County on Highway 269, 10 miles south of Jasper. The prophet said that the knowledge of the glory of the Lord will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. So prepare your hearts to receive from the Word, because when all else fails, God's Word works. Praise His name. Open your Bibles, if you will, please, to the book of Genesis. The book of Genesis, chapter number 13. We will get there in a few minutes. I want to show you a couple things I thought were cute relating to Father's Day. Father's Day, Jesus says, every day is my Father's Day. <laughs> and how about this? Children. Oh, there's a sleeping dad. I'll go ask it questions. <laughs> Anybody relate to that? And this fellow says, uh, well, the rooster says, Dad, is that you? <laughs> Little out there, huh? And I, I love this one. I show it every year. iPod, iPad, and Dad says, I paid. <laughs> Isn't that great? And here's a new shirt. Maybe you've seen it on Facebook. I thought it was pretty good. It's Fa Thor. Fa Thor. You know, Thor, the, the superhero. It says, like a dad, just way mightier. See also handsome and exceptional. <laughs> so don't just say father. Say Fa Thor. <laughs> Praise God. Well, it's good to smile, isn't it? I want to ask you a question, men, today. Where is God on your bucket list? Where is God on your bucket list? Are there any spiritual goals or quests on your bucket list or just earthly pursuits? We're going to read in just a moment from Genesis chapter 13, starting with verse 1. I will be 50 years old in two months. And if I die before that time, I pray not, I can say I have had a wonderful life. I've been very fortunate. I've been very blessed. I've been given many opportunities. I have visited and preached in several countries. I've been to Costa Rica twice. I've been to Canada twice. I've been to Mexico, Honduras, Russia, Siberia, and the Bahamas. I have traveled, toured, and preached in 28 states. I was a full-time evangelist from 1987 to 1994. I preached in many churches, camps, retreats, conferences. I had two wonderful parents. I don't have a sob story to tell you about my childhood. I had a, a blessed childhood with two parents that loved God and they loved me, and I thank God for that. I have been married 26 years to the woman I love. I have three great children. Two of them are sitting right here on the front. I've had the privilege of pastoring this church for the last 20 years. I've been on numerous TV shows, radio programs. I've had many of my articles published. Why am I telling you all this? Because I've made some checks on my bucket list. But look at somebody and say, I'm not done yet. We ice skated at the Rockefeller Center in New York City. Check off the bucket list. Been to Times Square twice. Went to a Broadway show and it was snowing when we came out. Man, it was magical. Went to the Statue of Liberty. I've been to the, on top of the Empire State Building. I've been to, to the Trump Tower. I've been to the 
top of the Rockefeller Center where you can see all of Manhattan. I've been to Ground Zero where Freedom Tower is, where the World Trade Center once stood. I've been to the crypt where Lenin's body is displayed in Red Square at the Kremlin in Moscow. I've been to Mount Vernon, George Washington's estate. I've been to Helen Keller and Elvis's birthplace of... Man, that's memorable, I tell you. I've drunk from Ponce de Leon's Fountain of Youth in St. Augustine. Apparently it didn't work. I'm still aging. I've been to Independence Hall where the Continental Congress convened. I've been to the Liberty Bell in Philadelphia. I've been to the Smithsonian, the White House, the Capitol Building, the Washington Monument, the Lincoln Memorial, the Jefferson Memorial, Arlington National Cemetery. I've been on the battlefield at Gettysburg. I've been to Cape Canaveral, the space station in Florida. I've been to Disney World so many times I can't count. Why? Because I grew up 90 miles from it. We went every year for our family. Then we went every year as a field trip from our school. So I lost count. One thing that was on my bucket list, because I grew up in Tampa in an NFL town, was I wanted to go to an NFL game. I grew up rooting for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, but we affectionately called them the Yuccaneers because they were so awful. But they always played on Sunday, and I was always in church on Sunday. I never got to see them. So the time came on a Thursday night. Me and Nathan met, and we went to Atlanta, and we got to see the Buccaneers play the Falcons on Thursday night football. And guess what? My team got blown out 55 to 14. But I got to see them. And I got to pay $10 for a Coke and a hot dog. Woo-ha! I've been to Ford Theater where Lincoln was shot. I've been to the Peterson house across the street where he died. A lot of checks on my bucket list, but I'm not done. There's more I want to do. I want to go to Israel. I want to go to the Grand Canyon. I want to go to Mount Rushmore. I want to go to Yellowstone. I want to go to Pearl Harbor. I want to go see the Niagara Falls. What is not on my bucket list is bungee jumping, skydiving, or climbing Mount Everest. Have at it. It's all yours. So let me ask you today, especially you men, what's on your bucket list? What is a bucket list anyway? It's a list of things a person wants to achieve or experience before reaching a certain age or dying. It comes from the old idiom to kick the bucket. There are things you want to do. There are places you want to go. There are people you want to meet, things you want to buy or own, goals you're pursuing. We pursue our career and our dream job. We, cur- we pursue our dream house, our dream car, our dream truck. We marry our dream girl. Or for you ladies, you marry your dream guy. You make the money. You get the boat, the tractor, the white picket fence, all the stuff we think we need in life. My question to you is, are we chasing after God the way we're chasing after things? Because everything in this world you pursue is Temporary. It will end. It will be gone. It won't matter in eternity. But the things that are spiritual are eternal. Hallelujah. Let me show you a scripture that I'm very fond of. Psalm 42, 1 and 2. As the deer pants for the water brook, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. David had a desire, a desire. Uh, uh, an appetite for spiritual things. And that's my prayer for you brothers today. That with all of the earthly pursuits you have, that you will have an appetite and a desire for spiritual things. Because they are lasting. Jesus said it this way, Matthew six thirty three. but seek first. Everybody say first. The kingdom of God and his righteousness. And what? All these other things will be added. Brother Tim, we talked about it in Sunday school. No good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. But we must realize and trust that what we think is good for us may not be what God knows is good for us. So where is God on your bucket list? 
Another version of Matthew 6, 33 says this, But above all, pursue his kingdom and righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. So the question is, what are we pursuing? What are we chasing after? The word pursue means to follow after in order to overtake, to chase, to strive, to gain, or to seek to attain. And they got every kind of TV show in the world now with people pursuing nearly everything under the sun. Some are chasing Bigfoot. Good luck with that. Others are chasing giant squid. Others are chasing storms and, and UFOs and sharks and antiques and sunken treasure and true love. Others are chasing dreams of a career in sports or music or real estate or fortune and fame in some other field. Friend, what are you chasing today? Be sure that above all else, you're chasing after God. Here's the good news. He's chasing after you. If we draw nigh to God, what's the promise? He will draw near to us. I want to just bring to your attention a great man in the Bible. He's known as the father of the faith. I think that's pretty appropriate for Father's Day to talk about Abraham. Real quickly, he was a great man. He had a great name. He became a great nation. In fact, there's 12 million Jews in the world today because of this man. Abraham had great faith, but here's the key. He served a great God. Woo, hallelujah. If you want to be a great man, put your faith in a great God. Hallelujah. A couple of key points about Abraham, his lasting legacy. He's the founder of two races, the Jewish race through Isaac and the Arab race through his son Ishmael. He is famous in three religions. He's revered in Judaism, he's revered in Islam, and he's revered in Christianity as well. We know he furthered the messianic line through which Jesus was brought to us. He is known as the father of the faith, and here's the key, he was the friend of God. Anybody here today aspire to be the friend of God? I consider everyone in this building my friend. But the Bible says there's a friend who will stick closer than a brother. And we know who that friend is. Amen? So let's talk about Abraham real quick. Three quick points I want to bring out to you. Abraham was, number one, the friend of God. Let's look here in uh, Genesis 13, verse 1. It says, And Abraham, or Abram, as his name was then, went up out of Egypt. By the way, Egypt was probably the largest and the greatest city in in ancient times, other than eventually Babylon. So it was what you would consider a bucket list city. If you wanted to go anywhere in Bible times, you'd want to go see Egypt. Well, Abraham saw it. Check. And his wife and all that he had, and Lot was with him in the south, and Abraham, say it with me, was what? Very rich in cattle, in silver, and in gold. Check, check. See the bucket list? All the things he has, all the things he's chasing after. And he went on his journeys from the south even to Bethel under the place where his tent had been at the beginning between Bethel and Hai, under the place of the altar which he had made there at first. And there Abraham did what? He called on the name of the Lord. He's been to Egypt. He's got a beautiful wife. In fact, ladies, I don't know what she had, but you better figure it out. Sarah was a knockout at 90. In fact, all of the kings wanted her in their harem. And Abraham was afraid they were going to kill him and steal his wife. So he lied and said, she's my sister. Well, that was part true. They had the same father but different mothers, and that was common in early Bible times. Let's, let's modernize it. She was hot. Check. He's got the cattle. He's got the gold. He's got the silver. He's got the girl. He's been to Egypt. He's been traveling all over these other places. All the check marks on his bucket list. But you know, there's still something in Abraham where he's chasing after God. You can read through and you see several times God appeared to him. Numerous times where he built an altar to the Lord. 
he, he realized that the, the earthly things were temporal and they would not ultimately satisfy that he had to have a connection and a relationship with his creator. Listen, there is a hole in your soul that nothing can fill except God. No amount of money, no amount of cars, no amount of drugs, no amount of sex, no amount of any fortune or fame in this world can fill the hole that only God can fill in your soul. The old song says it well, only Jesus can satisfy your soul. Otherwise, you're going to be searching and searching and searching and you're going to come up empty. Abraham was the friend of God. Yes, he was blessed with material things, but here's the thing, he stayed focused on spiritual things. Let me give you a scripture. James chapter 2, 21 through 23 says, Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Seest thou how faith wrought with his word? Works was faith made perfect, and the scripture was fulfilled which saith, Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. Think about that. A friend is someone you enjoy spending time with. Do you enjoy spending time with God? A friend is someone you do things together with. A friend is someone you confide in. You tell them your secrets. You call on them when you get in a snag. I'm stuck in a ditch. Can you come pull me out? Aren't you glad you got a friend you can call on? Woo, hallelujah. Here's what Jesus said about it in John chapter 15. Look at this. Uh, he, he says, greater love is no man than this, than, than to lay down one's life for his friends. And you are my friends if you do whatever I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing. But notice, I have called you friends. For all the things I've heard from my Father, I have made known unto you. How many believe it's time to advance beyond the servant-master relationship with God and advance to enjoy a father-son relationship with God? And let me say this to you dads. As your kids mature and they become adults, your relationship changes with them. It's no longer a commanding role. Once they're grown and gone, you can't boss them around anymore. You can try, but uh, they'll tune you out. And your role changes from a commanding role to an advisory role. And you become their friends. And you, you, you cheer when they succeed. And you pray for them. Hallelujah. Hallelujah that God will keep them in his will. There's a funny thing about fatherhood, guys. By the time you get experience, you're unemployed. <laughs> and about the time you're old enough to figure out your dad was right about a lot of things, you have kids that are old enough to think you're wrong about everything. <laughs> but Abraham... It wasn't a servant-master relationship with God. It wasn't even just a father-son relationship. It was a friendship with God. Pursue a friendship with God. Here's the second little point I want to share with you is that Abraham was favored by God. Back up to chapter 12, and let's talk about this a second. Verse 1, are you there? Genesis 12, 1. Now the word of the Lord said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy kindred from thy uh, thy country, thy father's house, unto a land I will show thee. How about that? God told him to leave and go somewhere and didn't even tell him where he was going. Now, how many know that's a leap of faith to go where, where you don't even know you're going? Verse 2, and I will what? I will make of thee a great nation. We know that's happened. I will bless thee and make thy name great, and you shall be a blessing. Verse 3, and I will bless them that bless you, and I will curse them that curse you, and in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. That happened through Jesus Christ, his offspring. Praise God. He had the favor of God. Uh, we talked about this Wednesday night, didn't we, Sister Linda? You, you brought this up. Have you ever heard this, living in the fog? 
It sounds like you're a space cadet, you know, you're living in the fog. F-O-G means favor of God. How many want to live in the favor of God? See, see, unbelievers, when good things happen, they say, oh, I'm lucky. But Christians, they know better. It's not just blind luck. It's not just coincidence. They know it's the hand of providence. They know it's the blessing and the favor of their heavenly father. They'll both somebody say, let's live in the fog. Hallelujah. Let's live in the favor of God. And Abraham had the favor of God. God said, you get out from among your, your country, out from among your kindred. Why? Because his father, Terah, was an idolater. We know that from Joshua chapter 24, and if you read the preceding chapter, it implies that. And so God said, I want you to get out from that idolatrous, heathen environment, and I want you to come and establish a new covenant with me. And if you do that, you're going to walk under my blessing and you're going to walk under my favor. And everywhere he went, hallelujah, the angels of the Lord went before him and people favored him because he had God's favor. What does it mean to have favor, to be blessed? Look at somebody say, I'm blessed. I love what Ken says. Every time I ask him, how you doing? He's a blessed by the best. Too blessed to be stressed. Hallelujah. <laughs> what does it mean to be blessed? It means to be highly favored. It means to be supremely happy. How many believe if anybody ought to be happy, it ought to be God's people? You know that old saying, if you're saved and you know it, notify your face? I don't understand. People on their way to heaven, have eternal life, filled with the Holy Spirit. Oh, they're depressed all the time. Come on, he's the glory and the lifter of your head. He'll give you joy that this world cannot steal and cannot take away. If you're blessed, you're supremely happy. You're highly favored. You're enriched with benefits and you're spiritually prosperous. Live in the fog. And if you have the favor of God, it doesn't matter if you have the favor of man. Because if God be for you, who can be against you? And here's what I've learned. If you have the favor of God, he'll give you favor with the right people. Now, not everybody's going to like you because the Holy Ghost in you is going to stir up some demons in them. Hello. But if you have the favor of God, you'll have the favor with the people you need to have favor with. Did you know this about Abraham? This is an interesting little factoid Abraham was the first to be called a Hebrew in Genesis 14, 13. It means the one who crossed over. And that term Hebrew, it's believed, comes from a man named Eber. He was an Eberite or a descendant of Eber. You read about him in Genesis eleven fourteen. 14. He, he crossed over because to leave Ur of the Chaldees, where he grew up, to go into the land of Canaan, he had to cross over the, Euphra the, the river Euphrates. He had to cross over. Well, how many are glad you have crossed over? You've crossed over from darkness into light. You've crossed over from the curse into the blessing. You've crossed over, hallelujah. You've left sin and servitude behind and you've, you've crossed over into freedom in Jesus Christ. Look at somebody say, I've crossed over. I'm one of the children of Abraham. I've crossed over. Not just a river, I've crossed over, hallelujah, in a spiritual sense. Here's what the Bible says. Galatians 3.29, if you are Christ's, how many are Christ's? Then you are Abraham's seed and you are heirs according to the promise. Listen to this. Abraham so identified with God that God identified himself with Abraham. Over and over and over in the Bible we read, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God said, he's such a friend of mine, I'm going to identify myself by my friend. I'm the God of Abraham. Whew, hallelujah. So, Abraham was the friend of God. Abraham was favored by God. Here's the last part. We'll hush. Abraham stayed focused on God. I want you to go with me to Genesis 18 real quick as we close. God is about to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. But Abraham is such a close confidant to him. He says, you know what? I'm not going to hide this thing. I'm going to let, I'm going to let Abraham know what I do. That's what friends do. They let, they let you know their plans, don't they? And of course, Abraham 
begin to intercede. You know the story. Look at Genesis 18. Look at verse 17. And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham this thing which I do, seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him? For I know, this is the confidence God has in, in his friend Abraham, for I know him, that he will command his children and his household after him, that they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he has spoken unto him. How many know friends have influence with friends? God said, I'm going to wipe them off the face of the map. But, 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 but Abraham says, well, wait a second. You're not going to destroy the righteous with the wicked, are you? And he begins to negotiate with God. You've got to have a close relationship to do something like this. Lord, if, if I find 50 righteous, will you spare the city? I'll spare the city. Oh, well, there may not be that many. What, what if we find only 40 righteous? Man, you've got to have some gumption to negotiate with God like this. He whittles it down all the way down to 10. And God said, Abraham, you're such a friend of mine. I'll do it for your sake. I'll spare the city if I only find 10. Here's the sad thing. God could not find even 10 righteous people. Listen, I've heard preachers say this my whole life, and I, I disagree with this statement. How many have heard this statement before? If God doesn't judge America, he'll have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. How many have heard that said before? There's two problems with that statement. Number one, God doesn't apologize to anybody for anything because everything he does is always right. The second thing that's wrong with that is I would like to believe there's more than 10 righteous people in this building. Much more all across this land, I believe there's praying people, godly people that are still seeking after him and God is holding back judgment because of their influence. I believe judgment will come to America, but how many believe it doesn't have to happen on our watch? We can cry out. We can stand in the gap and make up the hedge, and God can postpone it and send revival instead. I challenge somebody to say, God, do it again. That's the kind of clout Abraham had with God. He negotiated him all the way down to 10. But notice how Abraham stayed focused on God with all the stuff he'd been blessed with. God says, I can trust him to be faithful. He's going to stay focused on what's right. The blessings I've given him won't distract him. They won't corrupt his heart. He's still going to walk in my ways. How do we know <laughs> Abraham kept God on his bucket list? After all of his traveling, all of his accumulated wealth, Gold, silver, cattle, servants. He was still seeking after God. Listen, he was still looking for a city. Let's read this scripture together. Hebrews 11. By faith Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, he obeyed and he went out not knowing whither, where he was going. By faith he sojourned in the land of promise as in a strange country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. Look, with all the stuff he has, what's he doing? He's still looking for a city that hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Men and ladies, go ahead, check off your bucket list. But with all of the things you accumulate and all the, the experiences you have and all the, the pleasures of this life you get to enjoy, keep seeking after that city. Keep seeking after the one who made that city. Keep seeking after God. Keep pursuing him. Where is God on your bucket list? I hope he's not near the bottom. I hope he's right at the top. Amen? Will you stand with me this morning? I want to pray for these men today. Will every man that's in the house. Hello everyone, this is Pastor Ben Godwin. I'd like to remind you that I write a monthly column for the religion page of the Daily Mountain Eagle. It comes out on Saturdays. Watch for that and read it and pass it along. Also, if you follow me on Facebook, you can read the digital version of that same article. 
which is often posted in other publications like Charisma Magazine. Also, I've written four books that I'd love to share with you. My first was God's Strategy for Tragedy. It documents my miracle testimony, how I was struck by a car as a seven-year-old boy while riding a bicycle and lost three inches of bone. I was supposed to be a semi-cripple the rest of my life, but God intervened and called me to preach. The story is documented with x-rays, photographs, and medical reports. My second book was entitled, A Practical Pattern for Prayer. Prayer moves the hand that moves the world. This book will give you practical guidelines on how to pray more effectively, and it will reignite your passion for prayer. History proves that God moves when his people pray. My third book is entitled, The Redemption Files, True Tales of Turned Around Lives. God is a master at bringing good out of bad. This book details the stories of several Bible characters and shows how God brought good out of bad in their lives, and he can do the same in your life as well. My fourth book is entitled, A Pilgrim's Perspective, Points to Ponder Along Your Path. This book reminds us that we are pilgrims passing through. So don't get too attached to the things of this world because this is just our temporary home. A few years ago, I was fortunate to be invited on Sid Roth's international television program entitled It's Supernatural. He interviewed me about my miracle testimony and they did a phenomenal job dramatizing and reenacting my testimony story. You will want to watch this DVD because it will build your faith. Of course, the best deal is to get all four books in one bundle plus the testimony DVD for one low price of $25 plus shipping and handling. You can place your order for any of the books individually or the whole bundle at bengodwin.org or you can call our church office at 205-686-9210. Hello everyone, this is Pastor Ben Godwin thanking you for watching our broadcast today. I pray it has been a blessing and a source of spiritual enrichment for you and your family. I want to remind you that every program we air is available on DVD for a donation of $5 or more. If you would like a copy, please send your request and donation to Good Springs Full Gospel Church, P.O. Box 3161, Jasper, Alabama, 35502.